Okay, you are here with Mr. Price. Um, we are going to talk about um, biodiversity and the things that are happening in um, our biosphere um, and what some of those issues are with biodiversity. Um, this is chapter 6-3 in unit 10. So what is biodiversity? The, the simplest answer I can give you is, is if you look at this picture of the coral reef and all these fish and all these different types of coral and different sea enemies and all the creatures that are here, that is a really good um, description in this small picture of a lot of biodiversity. Now think of the rest of the screen. So if I drew a little picture right here um, and had just this, this is my another Next picture, and here we go. There's one fish. That is very low biodiversity, so that is bad. That is not what we want. We don't have a lot of different creatures in this. This picture to um, your left or right, right here, is a lot of biodiversity. So this, by the end of this lecture, you should understand that this is better than this. This is not what we want to see. So what is biodiversity? It's the sum of all the genetic-based variety of all of the organisms in our biosphere, not just in coral reefs, but everything from the polar zones through the temperate zones all the way down to the tropical zones. Um, and within that, within our biosphere, is all the sum of the genetic differences are created. So biodiversity is created by how different each ecosystem can be. So again, we go back and we talk about um, Star Wars a little bit, Tatooine, Hoth, some of those places, the desert, the polar regions, the deciduous forests, the carnivorous forests, all of those are different ecosystems. And what happens is they create different habitats and therefore they create different biotic communities that um, give them a vast difference between each other and that helps to the overall having so many different creatures on our planet. Species diversity is the number of different species in the um, biosphere. So again, we're looking at all the total of all the organisms and all the taxons, um, all the kingdom taxons and the domain taxons on this planet. And the more species there are on this planet, the higher chance that we can survive and reproduce and um, pass on our genes um, as, a, as living organisms throughout time. Um, genetic diversity is the sum of all of this stuff. And again, I want to draw a little picture here. Um, very simple is if you look at um, genetic diversity, it's, if you look at every organism on this planet, they all have this stuff called DNA. And if you take that DNA and add it all together, um, the more genetic sequences we have, the better um, the genetic diversity is. So if we have, again, it's just a simple numbers game. If we have two organisms on the planet, we have very low genetic diversity. If we have billions, trillions of creatures on this planet with, that are slightly different, then we have a larger genetic diversity. So genetic diversity um, refers to the forms of different genetic information carried on our planet. What and why is this all important? So it goes back to my simple picture that I had about the little fish is each one of the creatures on this planet, the more that there are, the higher the possibility that we as living organisms will survive and reproduce and be able to basically pass on our DNA and survive maybe another 3.8 million years on this planet. If we are just this one fish, we have very low diversity, we're probably not going to make it. And there's, then all life, if it was a low number, let's say there was 100 total creatures on this planet, we're probably not going to make it because there's not enough genetic um, difference between each of us to survive and reproduce. So um, why is this beneficial to us? One, it'll keep us alive because we'll have more food. We'll be able to use some of these things as industrial products. And I think the most important one to us is that as we get better with technology, we might find better ways to solve 
uh, medical issues. Um, the way I put it to you in class is that if you're in the rainforest, you could be killing off the flower, and this is my flower, that has the genetic sequence to kill or cure um, things like like um, Alzheimer's or um, Parkinson's or maybe even cancer you might have a genetic sequence that can cure cancer. So again, kind of important for us to take a look at all the types of um, biodiversity. So again, here's a picture. Um, insects actually have the most species diversity um, within them. Uh, other animals uh, other than us have this. Um, plants are decent but again the largest one is insects so it's a hypothesis of mine that after we're gone insects will be um, what cruises around in the dominant species on the planet. So what are threats to biodiversity? The first one is what we just talked about in the last chapter is deforestation, um, desertification, anytime that we are destroying ecosystems or destroying the habitats of specific biotic factors. Um, basically, it's lowering that number, so we're taking and slowly killing off um, numbers of creatures, and that can harm biodiversity. Um, some of the behaviors that we have, we know that for the last 12,000, 10,000 years that we have the ability to hunt animals to extinction. My example on this slide is um, the woolly mammoth, and we should really think about um, if we keep hunting species to extinction and influencing them to extinction by hunting, we should, we're lowering our biodiversity. So there are people that are upset about the wolf population, but it's pretty cool that they're still here and we can still have that conversation about them. And those wolves are all adding to the biodiversity on our planet. Pollution is a big one. Um, air pollution, um, land pollution, soil pollution, and um, river and ocean pollution are also affecting biodiversity. And what happens with pollution is something called biological magnification. And an example of this, and again there's another slide after this, uh, DDT is an insecticide that got into um, our ecosystems, especially out here in the west. And what happened was fish eating birds like um, offspray and um, bald eagles and golden eagles were being influenced um, by this stuff called DDT. So let me real quick jump ahead. This is biological magnification. So DDT, which is this little red dot, got into this, into the water supply in the, um, because they were um, flood irrigating and other things, getting it into the water. Eventually it gets sucked up in, into the producers and those producers pass it along each trophic level and eventually it gets more condensed. So if you take 10 molecules here, it might not be a big deal because it's spread out more, but as it gets passed up, those 10 molecules will get more and more condensed and the concentration per fish or per small fish or per, um, eventually, fish eating birds gets really high. And what happened was these um, fish eating birds, their eggs were being um, harmed by it and they couldn't produce offspring that would survive very much longer after those eggs were laid. So we were seeing a drop in these numbers of birds and we stopped using DDT and this is kind of a positive and eventually we got back um, those fish eating birds such as a bald eagle. And it's kind of cool because you guys can now go out and see those and they've been taken off the endangered species list. So biological magnification affects the highest or the highest trophic level. DDT is an example of that. Uh, foreign species is another threat to biodiversity. So um, if we, and you've heard probably about um, people talking about noxious weeds, what that is is it's an invasive species that gets in and can kill off the natural plants and it, maybe even the natural animals that are in that um, environment. And it's not a good situation because those invasive species could end up changing the entire um, ecosystem and killing off some of those creatures that once lived there. So again, foreign species, there's the DDT again. And then what do we need to do? Well, it's pretty cool that um, Teddy Roosevelt's kind of the leader in this. It's called conservation. And he basically said, we're gonna start taking our natural resources in some of the places that we have that are pretty cool, like Yellowstone and Yosemite National Parks, and protect them. And since we've started conserving them, we have, um, Idaho is actually the second, second most protected state, um, like the Frank Church Wilderness Area, the Sawtooth Wilderness Area, um, Payette, Boise, all these are protected areas where you can't just go in and um, take natural resources without um, some really, really special um, legal 
rights and stuff. So basically, you can go in and enjoy what would naturally be there in those areas. We need to start, and we have been protecting per species. So we put species on endangered species list, and it, so far we've done really good about bringing back their numbers and at least holding them. Um, one of those is a polar bear, and we're kind of worried about that and see, see how that's going to play out here in the next few years. Uh, we need to protect and do some more conservation and protect entire ecosystems. Um, which will ensure that the natural habitats of creatures will be there. So the abiotic factors will be there. So those um, species, those biotic factors will have um, the ability to survive and reproduce. Again, uh, conservation, all of this applies to it. Um, national forests, service parks, marine sanctuaries. Um, we just got to take care of those things and make sure that we're not harming them. Uh, charting the future. So we know that we have holes in the ozone. We know that that's contrib contributing to adding more UV rays. Um, we have done some outlaw as I think it was 14 nations said we're not using CFCs anymore. Our production of CFCs have gone down. They were supposed to ban them by 2000. And what's happened is we've seen this whole stop and we've seen the number of ozone basically plateau out on our ozone charts. So it's been some good. Um, but we still see a hole above Antarctica and in the Arctic, but that hole has slowed down the amount of ozone, which is O3, has slowly at least plateaued and hasn't spiked um, down. So it's kind of a cool thing. Uh, we could talk real quick about uh, climate change and global warming. Remember, global warming is an increase in the natural greenhouse effect. And how that occurs is, the theory is we are putting more CO2 in the air and we are also in a natural upswing in temperature. But because of this added CO2 to the atmosphere because of things like this, we are getting an increase in the overall temperature and we've gone up um, roughly about um, a degree or two at um, the equator, which equates to about 15 degrees um, overall potential range of change at the poles, which is why we've seen some melting of the glaciers and the polar ice cap. So possible effects of global warming, we have some melting of the polar ice caps and glaciers. Um, we have raisings, or rising excuse me, sea levels. Um, prediction by 2100 is to go up about three feet and a change in weather pattern. Again, this, and this is speculation and hypothesis from Mr. Price, but we had 4,000 tornadoes this year and never had that before in recorded history. Um, it's kind of interesting to see how weather patterns and climates are slowly starting to change because of an increase in temperature. The last thing I want to leave you with is fairly well, um, and that was the last slide of biology. So I hope that helps. Thanks.